YouTube. Okay, now it's working. So we're on three platforms actually here on Facebook with my cell phone, then we're on Zoom and then on YouTube. Hey, <laughs> hey Christina, again. <laughs> And there says hi, Thomas and Shanna. Yeah, some people watch the German first and then the English. That's awesome. Because you're amazed. Uh, you're more uh, yeah. I'm tired. Yeah, very good. Oh, let me turn on the recording. I was forgetting. So, okay, maybe. Oh, wait a second. See if anybody's eye on youtube there's one person watching it's probably me actually <laughs> so yeah nobody's aware that we're on youtube now so we don't have a following yet, but that, well, i now need to get away from facebook but uh so let me go to i have to switch back and forth a little bit between zoom and here facebook on my phone and then youtube etc so all right Hey, Sarah Reedy from Colorado. So we're talking about flying changes again, because our flying changes course is starting and you can sign up for another couple of days or so. And so today I wanted to chat a little bit about the biomechanics of the flying change. Um, up that English one. So um, the flight change is interesting. It's it's essentially a canter depart, right? You can explain it as a canter depart. Um, so the movement pattern, the biomechanics is very similar to the canter depart from the walk or the trot, right? When you do a canter transition from the walk or from the trot, uh, the outside hind leg lifts the horse into the canter. And the, the more the outside hind is engaged before the transition and the more it's flexed before the transition, the more uphill the canter will be, the better the quality of the canter will be. So sometimes, you know, it's enough to just give a couple of half falls into the outside hind when it's already enough underneath you, then you just flex it a little bit and off you go, right? But sometimes the outside hind leg is not under you, it might be up behind you, it might be off to the side. So in that case, it makes sense to engage it first. So use some sort of a lateral movement to bring that outside hind leg under the body and then sit on it half fall, and then you, you can canter. So, and, and all the same things apply um, when you're doing a flying change. It's just the transition from the left lead canter into the right lead canter. It's like a canter depart from the left lead into the right or vice versa, right? So in, in the walk canter, trot canter transition, the outside hind leg lifts the horse into the canter. And then when you're in the left lead canter, for example, then that left lead will be, uh, the left hind leg will be the outside one in the right lead canter. So in other words, when you're cantering on the left lead, you have to find a way to flex that left hind leg, that's, which is the inside one at that point. And when you can flex it enough, um, compress it, so to speak, between the body mass and the ground, then it creates a counter pressure and that hind leg wants to extend again uh, in its joints and you use that um, energy of that compression to trigger the, the flying change, right? So it's important that that inside hind leg is underneath you and not somewhere next to you. It's important that you can reach it with your weight and with your half falls so that inside hind leg has to allow uh, the half falls to go through. And when it does that, the horse can do a flying change that's straight and uphill. And if the inside hind leg is not underneath you, or if it's not flexing, then the change will probably fail. So if the horse is crooked and the inside hind leg is somewhere next to you, then you can't reach it with the weight, you can't reach it with a half fall. So most likely you're not gonna get a flying change or not a clean one at least. Or if the horse is sort of strung out and the hind legs are both out behind, then uh, yeah, you can't sit on the inside hind leg either. You can't flex it and the horse will just, uh, or the hind legs will push the body mass forward and sort of into the ground, but it, it won't, the hind legs won't lift the body mass up. up. So that's you know, not a good starting point for, for a flying change either. Um, yeah, so 
when you're cantering, make sure the hind legs are underneath you, especially the inside one is underneath you. Um, then shift the weight into the inside hind leg, flex it with your weight and with half holes. And uh, when the inside hind leg accepts the weight and flexes under the weight, then it's fairly easy to change the bend. Whereas if the inside hind leg is not flexing under the weight, then the horse will most likely be leaning on the outside shoulder because you know the canter is a little related to the haunches in. So the horse would naturally love to be to canter in a in a sort of a faulty haunches in position, right? And then the weight is on the outside shoulder. And uh, from that position, you, you cannot ride a flying change, at least not the clean one. Uh, the, the horse would be laid behind probably if he changes at all. So straighten the horse, shift the weight to the inside hind. This enables you to change the bend. And then once you've changed the bend, you can trigger the flying change by nudging the croup a little in the other direction. Right? And um, yeah, when you, when you really think of, of what happens in the flying change, in the moment, right? The inside, old inside hind leg touches down. It has to support the weight, like I said. And then it has to push you up into the change. And uh, the old inside hind leaves after the old outside hind, but it has to land before the old outside hind, the new inside hind, right? The, after the suspension phase, the outside hind lands first and then the inside hind and outside front together. So in order to switch, you know, the pelvic position and which hind leg lands first and which hind leg reaches more forward, you essentially have to slow down the inside hind because the inside hind is always ahead of the outside. So on some level, you could think it's always faster than the outside hind. Now to reverse that, you have to hold the inside hind on the ground and speed up the outside hind, right? So holding the inside hind on the ground is done, for example, by sitting on it, half halting into it, stepping into it, stirrup stepping. And uh, you can accelerate the new inside hind leg by moving the pelvis a little in the new direction. So initially that can be with a hint of haunches in, in the new direction. And that pushes the new inside hip forward and the new inside hind leg more under the body. <clears throat> yeah, so um, that, that's an important aspect to keep in mind. Shift the weight into the old inside hind, hold that inside hind a little bit on the, on the ground, flex it, and then push the croup in the new direction so the new inside hind leg reaches more forward. And <clears throat> the change happens in the suspension phase, right? That's why um, the calmer the tempo and, and uh, yeah, the more uphill the canter or the, the longer the suspension phase, um, the more time the horse has and the easier it is for the rider to, to get the timing right. And uh, now some horses are pretty quick with their hind feet. Yeah, they start the change with the hind legs um, when as soon as they're in the air and the inside front may still be on the ground and then as the hind legs lift up, up you see some horses already starting to reorganize their body um, in that moment, right? Basically at the end of the third beat of the canter stride. And then when the front leg lifts off or the front legs lift off, um, they change the front legs too. And then they change clean in the same stride, but you can clearly see how it's initiated from the hind legs. Other horses are a little slower. They, they change you know, when all four feet are off the ground. Um, and then, you know, they land with a new outside hind leg first. Um, yeah, so now if the, the canter quality isn't good enough, then um, the front legs don't come off the ground enough. That means then the suspension phase is short, you know, and the canter, you know, horse sort of canters into the ground, then <clears throat> there won't be enough time to reorganize the feet in the in the air. And yeah, then you either don't get a change at all, or you get maybe a change that's late behind, etc. Um, there is the opposite issue as well. There are horses that lift the forehand almost too high. Um, that could create a couple of different um, issues. So if the, the forehand lifts very high, then uh, 
the inside hind touches down before the outside front, right? This becomes, you know, a little bit like a school canter. You know, the old school canter was like that, but nowadays we have uh, horses that are so athletic that they can do this even in a working canter, almost a medium canter, that they lift the front end so high up and then outside hind touches down first, inside hind is second, outside front is third, inside front is fourth, so it becomes a four beat canter. And some horses then don't really have the strength to support the body mass that much with the hind legs, so they get crampy, right? And then uh, they get stiff and then they, they can't change at all because their hind legs are squished against the ground. Other horses, you know, can you know, have the strength to canter like that, but then they uh, will change leads, for example, when the, both hind legs are on the ground and both front legs are in the air. And then, so they change in front first. And then when the front legs touch down, they change behind. I had a, an old teacher who had a horse that, that did that a little bit. She, she would lift the forehand a little bit too high in the canter, which, you know, on, on the one hand looked nice and, you know, looked impressive, very uphill canter, but it created that problem that uh, when she showed the horse, the judges always said changes the leg behind, right? But it, it was not the, the classic case of the hind legs not changing in time. Yeah, not, the, the, she wasn't really late behind, but it was more like um, the hind legs weren't able to, physically not able to change when the front legs changed because of that issue of the hun front legs too high off the ground. So both hind legs were stuck on the ground, both front legs in the air, so the front legs can change. And the hind legs can only change once they're in the air. And that was, you know, too much of a separation there. Yeah, so um, flying changes need to be on the one hand ridden in, a, in an uphill canter, but not too uphill, right? So there, there is a limit you know, to how much uphill uh, the horse can handle, uh, and before you before you get into problems, and uh, that, that's also in, like in the German group, I was saying that that too. Uh, historically, the flying changes don't really become a thing until the 19th century. Um, in the 17th and 18th century, the aristocrats were much more interested in pushing collection to the limit. You know, they did um, ultra collected movements, and in the canter, they they would collect the horse until they got that forebeat with the inside hind touching down before the outside front. They did that, especially in the haunches in position. They cantered a lot in, in haunches in um, on straight line circles and so on. And then if you increase the collection even more in that, when you have that forebeat school canter, now you, you jazz the horse up a little bit more, lift the forehead even more. <clears throat> then you get a two beat canter, right? Then both hind legs touch down together and then the front legs touch down together. And then that's a terre a terre or misere, right? In a haunches in position, it's terre a terre on a single track, it's misere. Then you approach the airs above the ground, right? If you make the horse bounce even more in that two beat movement, then you can get a corbett or you can get a capriole, for example. So that, that's what, what the uh, 17th, 18th century masters were interested in. Then in the 19th century, you know, aristocrats had run out of money. They couldn't afford their riding schools. Um, uh, Baroque horses were falling out of fashion. Thoroughbreds came in into fashion. Um, and, and, you know, with the French Revolution, a lot of French aristocrats had to flee the country. So they didn't, to, uh, to avoid the guillotine, right? So they, they ended up in England and in England, they, they encountered fox hunting, steeple chasing. So all of a sudden thoroughbreds were cool, riding fast across country was cool. So that changed the whole riding culture. And then because the aristocrats didn't uh, finance high school dressage anymore, um, the military now had to take over the role of um, you know, preserving uh, classical dressage, the training knowledge, but they had different goals. They had different needs. They had also different horses than the aristocrats. So everything happened in a much more horizontal balance, much less, you know, the high school <clears throat> balance. Yeah, because the um, aristocrats couldn't afford the same number of horses and trainers anymore as before. Um, the civilian trainers had to go make money in the circus, right? That was basically the only place where they 
could make a living right um so and in the in the circus then you know they were also using more thoroughbreds not so much the old baroque horses and they had to come up <clears throat> with interesting and spectacular looking stuff that people would pay money to see <clears throat> so that's where the you know the canter on three legs and the canter backwards uh, originated right and then flying changes and, te and tempo changes like they they became fashionable in the circus because they were spectacular to watch whereas before nobody did them you know the uh, old you know baroque and renaissance riding masters they were interested in different things and the first mention of flying changes is in the uh, late 18th century like ludwig hunersdorf is the first author I, I can think of who mentions flying changes. Um, and, you know, it's, it's weird for us to think, but uh, Pluvinel never wrote a flying change as far as we know. And uh, De La Guerinia yeah, probably didn't either. He does, doesn't mention them, doesn't, doesn't mention flying changes anywhere. And, uh, yeah, they, they probably be, yeah, were introduced sometime in the second half of the 18th century, maybe after De La Guerinia's death. And then they didn't really become popular until the 19th century and the thoroughbred and yeah, when everything was done in a more horizontal balance. So that's the interesting is like, because we take flying changes so much for granted, right? And the, the temp, tempo changes are such an integral part of all the FEI level tests that it's hard to imagine that there was a time before flying changes or before tempo changes. Yeah. So anyway, just a little, detour, the historical detour. <laughs> so, yeah, but so to, to get back to the biomechanics of the flying change, there are five skills that the horse has to master in order to be able to do clean flying changes reliably. Um, number one is the horse needs to be really mindful and attentive. So every stride, the horse has to really pay attention to the rider. So you can have a, a meaningful conversation with your horse and you can shape the canter stride because you know for every movement there's a certain balance that's required so the horse can actually do the movement and it's the same for the flying change. And uh, you know the canter that the horse is offering you naturally or currently may, oops, may not be the best balance for the flying change or may not be possible it may not be possible for the horse to do a flying change so you may have to change the shape of the stride so you may have to make it quicker or slower you may have to make it more uphill or more horizontal you know depending on you know whether the horse is too elevated in the canter or if he's on the forehand you have to be able to make the canter strides rounder bouncier and so on you have to be able to change the balance so that's the first thing this mindfulness and attentiveness the second prerequisite, uh, you know, I already mentioned earlier is the weight shift. You have to be able to uh, shift the weight more into the outside pair of legs, more into the inside pair of legs. You have to be able to rock the weight a little back and forth. And when the horse can shift the weight more to the inside pair of legs or to the inside hind, then he can also change the bend, right? So you could be cantering in a left lead canter but the horse could be looking to the right a little bit right so that would be the prerequisite number three change the bend then prerequisite number four is to that the horse needs to be able to move the hips easily left and right um, because that's the trigger for the flying change that you move the croup a little in the new direction so there is a tiny hint of haunches in in that new direction yeah and the fifth um, prerequisite is that you can move hips and shoulders completely independently of each other, also the pole. So in other words, if you want to move the croup a little to the right, then the shoulder has to stay on the line of travel. It's not allowed to swing to the right or to the left and so on. So if you move the croup right and the shoulder also goes to the right, then if you did a flying chain from left to right, the horse would probably change in front first and then behind after that. So it would not be a clean change. Um, if you move the croup to the right and then the horse moves his shoulders to the left at the same time, then 
you do a flying change from left to right and the horse probably lands crooked, you know, with the shoulders also drifting to the left and the haunches drifting to the right. And if the horse lands crooked, you couldn't do another flying change right away. <clears throat> You'd have to fix that crookedness first. Yeah. So that, that becomes relevant then with respect to tempo changes. If you want to do tempo changes, you have to land ready for the next flying change essentially, right? And then that, be, that becomes like the next goal once the horse can do a flying change re fairly reliably in both directions, then the next thing is to, to yeah, keep the horse so balanced, so straight, so uphill before the flying change, during the flying change, after the flying change, that you can go right into the next flying change, right? And then, then you're often running towards tempo changes, right? So uh, it's um, sort of a technical skill, it's craftsmanship, right? Teaching flying changes and all, even teaching um, yeah, tempo changes is um, like a methodical process. It's something that you can learn. It's not black magic. It's not something that's sort of reserved for a chosen few for, for a small elite. It's something that uh, yeah, most people can learn, most horses can learn. Um, yeah, so if, if you know how, you know, and you, you can um, practice the biomechanics and the, the movement patterns of the flying change at the walk and at the trot in slow motion. So the horse has time to think um, which leg is next, where does it go? Where do I need to have, where do I support myself so I don't fall over, right? And the rider then has time to think, okay, now what do I do with my seat? Where do I have to turn? You know, in which direction do I rotate my pelvis? Where do I need to sit? What does, does my leg do? What does my rein do? You know, so you have time because there's a lot of things that have to happen in a, in a very short time frame when you do it in the canter with a flying change. Uh, you have to do a lot of things in a very short amount of time. And of course, if you've never done it, it's almost impossible, right? But if you can break it down, if you can practice it in slow motion, just like a musician would practice a new piece of music very slowly and really thinking about which finger goes where and, you know, that sort of thing, then you, you get a, an understanding of what to do when and where and how and why. Then it starts to seep into your body and to develop a muscle memory for it. And then as you can do it smoothly at the slower gate, you can move up one gate, do it a little faster. <laughs> then initially that might feel a little awkward or not, not quite as fluid as you would like it. So you practice it until that becomes easy and fluid. And then yeah, when you can do it well in the trot, then you do it in the trot with a canter depart in the location where the flying change will take place later. And then when all of that goes well and it's smooth and easy, then you can try in the, in the canter and try the flying change. And if the flying change doesn't happen, then you can look at, well, which part of that lead up process didn't work? Like where was it, where was the glitch? Which body part didn't move smoothly or easily enough? Or you know, which part of the biomechanics wasn't in place for that? attempted flying change. And then you could go and work on that part, teach the horse that skill or supple that body part that wasn't working and then try it again. So whatever 90, 95% of the preparation of flying changes is really done at the walk and the trot, right? And I, I only ride the canter and the flying change to check whether my preparation was good enough and you know, sufficient in, in terms of thoroughness and time that I spent on it. And uh, yeah, so you don't teach flying changes by suddenly applying the flying changes aid on a young horse as you know, as you would on a, on a horse that's been doing the, the flying changes for years, because that would only confuse the horse and they wouldn't know what to do. But you lead the horse down a road, you know, of discovery to the flying changes. And uh, you, know, you teach the horse the component parts, and then you see very quickly which component the horse understands, which he doesn't, which one he doesn't understand, uh, which body part moves well, which body part doesn't move well, and then you can troubleshoot and 
pinpointedly eliminate those obstacles um, from the from the course or from the path of the flying changes. Um, yeah, and then you know you you use your flying changes really more as as a way to test and to evaluate. And when you find that yeah something isn't working yet, you don't keep doing the flying changes. You go back to the uh, introductory exercises or write additional exercises to um, get the body part unstuck that is not moving right or you know, write an exercise that improves the horse's understanding of the, those mechanics. And then when you've made more progress in, the, in that area, then you can try the next flying change. So, so the flying changes initially may be few and far between, but you do a lot of practicing at the walk and trot. And you know that way you um, kind of stack the odds in your favor and then you you minimize the the number of failed attempts you know you try to have a high success rate so it's uh, um, you know not frustrating for the horse or or for you right and uh, yeah as the changes get more reliable of course you can do more in a session and then you can you know, practice them in different places and eventually you know build up to the to the tempo changes. Oh Anne is saying hey, hello from New York. Thomas, your suggestion yesterday to do trot canter transitions worked well. I'll write it up in the flying changes group. Great suggestion things. I'm glad. Glad it worked. Very good. Kathleen Norton says the history is so interesting. Amazing how there are certain major upsets in life that change the trajectory of certain things, sort of like the question of how the future will look after the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the course of dressage especially, or you know, is, is determined very much by which part of, which segment of society um, does most of the riding or spends most of the money, so to speak, on teaching, training, and horses, Be and, and what are their interests, what are their needs, their goals, because that uh, determines the choice of horse, and that determines uh, the type of training that's being done, right? So the old aristocracy had a very different you know, interest in riding than, than the military had, right? So, and, and, you know, the old aristocracy used these Baroque horses that were especially suitable for, for these airs above the ground, you know, and Piaf and Passage and so on. Um, but the military in the 19th century had very different needs, right? They had no, no need for airs above the ground or high collection. They needed to move large numbers of troops over terrain, you know, and they needed to be able to do their big assaults in, in large groups, right? Um, and yeah, they needed horses that were versatile that way that could climb up and down hills and jump over creeks and uh, you know swim through a river etc et and um, they didn't have that much money of course military right um, they had to get the cheapest possible horses and then in the 19th century all the napoleonic wars killed so many horses that the stud farms couldn't produce enough so they had to catch wild horses somewhere in the pusta in hungary or in Poland, you know, so basically sort of a, a European equivalent of the, the Mustangs, right? And then they had to take these horses that hadn't been handled and were maybe five or six or seven or eight years old. And then they had to somehow make them usable so that a fairly average rider was able to, to get along, walk, trot, canter, you know, in formation too, you know, um, so they could keep their spot in their group, in their squadron. So very different requirements compared to the court riding schools in the 18th and 17th centuries, right? And that, that changed the nature of training very much, you know? So, uh, yeah, and now, of course, you know, military doesn't have horses anymore. Now the horse is a family member, a companion, a psychotherapist for us, right? So, uh, yeah, we, we have very different needs and very different requirements. And so, again, you see a big change in... Uh, the way horses are ridden and trained you know some people go off and do the competition thing other people just do the strictly the uh, companion you know family member thing with with their horses right so they yeah and that again builds subsets of 
training methodology and uh, different breeds that are popular with the different groups of riders depending on what their what their interests are right yeah and sarah really says changing the bend should be feel this through the whole spine um yes preferably because of course if you're cantering on the left lead and you're you're getting a a shallow bend to the right through the whole spine then this left lead canter becomes very fragile and it's starting not to make so much sense to the horse anymore so then the horse may actually change leads just because you're changing the bend and suddenly you know yeah what you're doing doesn't make sense to the horse but he he starts to think well if i were cantering on the right lead now this would make sense to me what she's doing but cantering on the left lead with the weight on the left and a, a right bend through the body yeah becomes awkward becomes illogical somehow and then the horse tries to get comfortable tries to make sense of what you're doing and then um, either he will volunteer the flying change and he'll just do it or he'll do it easily when you prompt him and you say you know what would you like to canter on the right lead now as, as opposed to that left lead and then the horse will say ah oh, thank you now it makes all, all makes sense right so yeah so you're, you're creating a little bit of a um, a contradiction almost, you know, that the horse will try to solve and then, then you know, the flying change would be the, 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 the answer would be the solution for that contradiction, right? <clears throat> Christina says, sounds a bit similar uh, to jumping. If you want to go through more than just one jump, you have to go well before, in and after the jump. Yeah, very true. It's, it's very, very similar. Absolutely. Uh, everything goes so fast just as I can imagine that even jumping can help in preparing for tempi changes yeah it it could definitely um it's very true I mean jumping too you have to approach the the jump straight right keep the horse straight over the jump land straight so that you're ready for whatever right but if you approach crooked the horse might not might not clear the jump and so on and then you have it or he might clear the first one but not the next one because then the balance is already messed up and the horse is already already crooked right so uh, yeah interesting huh and uh then tanya van Miele says you just have to think flying change with my show jumpers and they change however if i try to do counter canter or control the flying change in the dressage ring it's incredibly difficult yes they anticipate and change too soon how can i get them on the eighth without making uh, them think they are doing something wrong but correcting at the same time yeah, that can be a bit of an issue, right? With the, the jumpers, um, like if they have these so-called auto changes where they just change leads when you change the bend, that can become an issue in, in the dressage ring. I mean, it's, it's practical when you're jumping, right? It's, it's cool, then you don't have to think about it. You just point the horse at, at the next jump and the horse you know, does whatever he needs to to get there, you know, and you know, so he, he just changes leads. Um, to fix that, um, you may have to explain to the horse that the counter canter is a thing too, that we don't just do flying changes, but we sometimes we do counter canter, right? Um, and for the counter canter, you can put the horse in a bit of a rendez position. Like if you if you ride a rendez um, in counter canter, then the counter canter becomes pretty stable and it makes it difficult for the horse to change leads. Um, when you take the horse from the rendez into a counter shoulder in position so in other words in counter canter move the shoulders a little to the outside and the haunches a little to the inside then the counter canter starts to become unstable and the horse is starting to think flying changes again so it, it might be useful with a jumper horse to ride whole school and put him in a rendez position, slight, doesn't have to be big angle, just one hoof breadth, like the sh shoulders, one hoof breadth to the inside, horse bending to the outside, and then maybe just to walk canter transition, walk, counter canter walk, counter canter walk, counter canter walk around the ring, so that he understands, okay, I need to canter on this lead, even though it's weird and I've never done that, and I usually change leads, you know, in that situation, but then you can explain to him, no, no, stay there, stay there, stay there, right? And, uh, that usually helps. Um, you may have to frame the horse really well, have your outside hip and leg a little bit more back maybe than usual, 
be super careful with the inside lower leg because the horse will interpret an inside lower uh, inside lower leg as a flying changes aid probably um so then if you need to drive in the counter can to do it with your outside lower leg not with the inside one if you need to do anything with the inside leg then try maybe do it with the inside knee and thigh not with the with the lower leg that sort of thing could even take the inside lower leg completely off at, at first right it's, it's a sort of a correction measure you just have your outside leg on have your inside leg a little off just so that it's very clear to the horse like the outside leg is there it's driving it's framing and on the inside there is room so you, you put the horse in that little one way out position um, and then so it's initially be very clear be overly clear so to speak exaggerate the, that seat a little bit and uh, then the horse will understand and okay, counter canter. She wants, she doesn't want me to change leads. She wants me to stay on that lead. And then gradually, you know, they get used to it. And then you can um, reduce the all their position. Then you can let your inside leg come back to the, to the horse and, and rest on the horse. And um, so gradually they, they understand it, you know. Initially, it's important to be very clear, you know, that the horse understands, okay, I. She doesn't want me to change. She wants me to stay in that canter. Then he may think, well, this is weird. I don't quite get why. I don't see the point of this, but oh, well, if that makes her happy, I'll just do it, right? So, and eventually they get used to it and they grow into it, right? And, uh, Sarah Reedy says, counter bending exercise. Do we feel bend through the whole spine? Yeah, the bend should always go a little bit. Even, even it should. It can be shallow. It can be very, you know, a small amount. But you should feel like yeah, there's sort of this bend going through the whole, through the whole spine, um, especially in the walk and the trot. It's it's not helping if you just bend the neck. You know, then you just disconnect the the neck from the rest of the body, and then the the, the neck gets wobbly, and um, that doesn't have any effect on the rest of the body. But we would like the whole body to change shape a little bit and the whole body to shift away the weight from one side to the other you know and then counter bending is super valuable if you just crank the neck in the other direction then it's not doing anything it's not helping the horse but if you create a shallow bend a little bit in the other direction that's gymnastically very very helpful it's more difficult to do of course but it's it's gymnastically more valuable hmm. then lauren S says we have a little mare who's almost opposite of the jumper question. She's very bendy and sensitive, and counter can is very easy for her. We want her, we want to help her get her changes. Do you have any advice for a horse that is perfectly happy to counter canter? Yeah, that's exactly the opposite issue that usually happens when people practice the counter canter too long, maybe because they were showing second level or whatever, you know, and uh, didn't want to lose points for because of an unwanted flying change and that can be tricky because then the horse may may think that you know the flying change is not wanted or doesn't exist or it's not a thing or you know then it may be difficult to convince the horse to to try a flying change but there um you know you can practice the movement sequence of the flying change like the preparation and the execution and so on um at the walk and the trot and so on and then eventually they, they'll probably do it. Um, you know, in our course, we have 12 different exercises you can use to um, teach the horse flying changes. Um, and some of them do the change from the counter canter to the true lead. It's something you, you can try. Um, there are also changes from true lead to counter canter or, you know, some exercises incorporate a change of, um, a change of rain. So you may have to experiment a little bit with which exercise works the best for the horse. Um, and yeah, in, I mean, in the counter canter, so as, as a basic rule of thumb, if you bring the haunches to the outside, counter canter is stable, the horse won't change. If you bring the shoulders to the outside and change the bend, then you're essentially putting the horse in the haunches in position in counter canter. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? So then a lot of horses will, will start offering changes or thinking of, of changes. So that, that's one thing. But overall, you just you have to teach the horse these mechanics of shifting 
the way, changing the bend, moving the croup. And so the, these have to be practiced at the walk and at the trot and so on as a, as a prerequisite for the flying changes. So let me check on YouTube. Hey, Sandra Ringsberg found us on YouTube and Jackie. Hey, awesome. <laughs> it's great that you, you found us on YouTube. Yeah. So let me just check here on my phone, see if there are any questions, but doesn't look like it. Not that I overlook something. Um, oh, it just tells me all the people who are joining and watching. Hmm. Yeah. Well, well, any more questions? Or can I tell you again about the Flying Changes course? Yeah, we did already some live streams about that. So the um, purpose of that course really is to teach people how to train their horses in flying changes. And it's, it's you know, for people who've never done it before with horses that have never done it before. And it's for people who um, have done it, but maybe are not that experienced or maybe people who have done it, but who now are training a horse that is having a hard time with flying changes or good for teachers who are trying to teach students flying changes, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, so we, we have even FEI riders in the, in the course and, and one of them who is, is now sort of on the, on the road to I2 and, and uh, Grand Prix. And she said that the course helped her clean up the, the two tempo changes because of the, the tips we have in there. Yeah. So there's another question here. Catherine Tate says, I know different folks use different aids for canter departure. How do you ask for just a regular canter depart? It's true, there are different things. I mean, the, the most important part or ingredient in that flying, uh, in the canter depart is that you flex the outside hind enough before the canter depart so that when the horse extends the joints of that outside hind, again, it lifts you up into the canter. So the I give a couple of half halls, and then I, you know, learn way back when that you ask with the in, with the inside leg, and I still tend to do that. So in, in pre preparing for the canter, I still tend to bring my outside hip and leg back, and then after my half halts, I give a little nudge with the inside calf. But you can also like press down with the inside seat bone when the inside hind is down and lift up when it comes off the ground, and if there is enough power in the horse, enough energy. The horse will canter from from that right i've uh, given you know knee pressures as as canter aids like first the outside knee then the inside then we had a horse in training many years ago that responded really well to that um i would not recommend cantering from your outside leg because that could confuse the horse if you want to ride a trot half pass at some point a lot of you know some some I think some of the Western riders and saddle seat riders and so on they they ask for the canter with the outside leg but that can uh, lead to misunderstandings when you try to do a trot half pass you know and you want the outside hand to cross more so you drive with the outside leg and if the horse breaks into the canter then that's annoying <laughs> so that's a um, can create a new issue then that might not be that easy to to fix again either so better to use something else not the outside lower leg for the for the candidate part so and there says so if i understand this correctly you would stirrup step into the inside hind the moment the seat bones are coming forward to then shift the horse's weight pelvis bend to the new lead yeah in the canter exactly when when your um, seat gets pulled forward you want to shift the weight to the inside and you can you know, step into the inside stirrup you can let the horse feel your inside seat bone you can you can half halt to press that inside hind more into the ground um, and uh, initially you you may have to take a couple of strides to to really create that weight 
if that it may not happen right away because it's maybe still new for the horse maybe they're not that quick in responding yet so you may have to shift the weight to the old inside hand for two or three strides create the new bend for a couple of strides and then ask for the for the flying change um yeah and it says ask for the new lead in the moment of suspension um the horse changes in the moment of suspension because of course you know when the only time the horse can reorganize his feet is when they're all off the ground but in order for the horse to be able to do that you kind of have to ask a little before that um, because the aid takes a little time to travel like from your brain to your seat and legs to the horse's belly muscles to the horse's brain back to the horse's feet and so on so there's you know a lot of distance that has to be covered by by the new runs right and the horse need, need, needs a little time to respond so uh, sometime be, if you ask for the flying change sometimes between the second and the third beat so between your seat getting pulled forward and the lowest point of the canter stride then uh, the aid will come through in the uh, moment of suspension um, so if you ask more or less you know when you know your seat gets pulled forward then that's the moment where the inside hind is the most compressed between the ground and the and the body weight and then you can uh, take advantage of that that rebound effect or the you know extension of the hind leg joints after that compression and then you know you get a dynamic flying change from there and so answers i've always done it with just the sense of when the horse is in the air and well that has usually worked how helpful is the stirrup step on the inside hind it, it can help with some horses more than with others like if you have a horse that's hot enough it's it can be good if you have a horse that's a little lazy a little sluggish then it might make the horse more sluggish to, to stirrup step. So I mean, stirrup stepping is optional. You don't need to, to use it. You can if you find that it helps. And uh, I mean, I myself also tend to give the, the flying changes a more um, out of you know, my intuition, my feel. I, I don't necessarily do that analytically. It's one of the few things I do more out of gut feeling, so to speak. Um, but you could do it either way. Okay. Yeah, some horses respond really well to the stirrup pressure into the inside, uh, inside hind leg or inside front leg even sometimes, um, that it creates this little impulse going down through the through the horse's inside leg, hind leg or front leg, and then in the rebound effect they bounce a little bit more off the ground and you can change you can change leads so then Ann says i'm thinking of zazan who is super sensitive and gets hot would that help ground him yeah when he's very hot then the stirrup stepping might be a good thing that might make it uh, calmer and you you may have to canter a number of strides stepping into the inside Stirrup, for example, like a rear, front, rear, rear, front, rear, yeah. And maybe use a little outside rain at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, initially it take, takes time for the horse to shift the weight, change the bend and so on. Later, later on, it all has to happen almost simultaneously, right? But initially it's good to, practice shifting the weight, changing the bend, but continue cantering on the same lead, right? And then again, shift the weight, change the bend, go straight. And then eventually when, when you have a really good feeling that feels easy, then, you know, shift the weight, change the bend and ask for the change, you know. Oh yeah, it has helped Anne's horse everywhere else a lot. Yeah, it makes sense, you know, it gives more connection to the ground and has a, a calming effect usually. Yeah, when the feet are more connected to the ground. So let me check on YouTube. Good, no questions there. Yeah, so let me go back to 
to to zoom. Yeah, yeah. So in in our course, we we show you you know twenty five different um, not twenty five <laughs> twelve. Sorry, I just saw number twenty five here. So uh, so twelve uh, different roads to the flying changes where you introduce the horse very systematically by walking the movement, uh, the pattern first, then trotting it, and trotting with a candidate part where the uh, um, flying change takes place and then eventually you do the, the, the flying change, right? And uh, in the course, so we also talk about prerequisites that the horse has to fulfill, prerequisites the rider has to fulfill, um, we give you exercises that are basically sort of prerequisites for flying changes. Um, we'll talk about uh, yeah, when you can start with the flying changes training. Um, when does it make sense? You know, what uh, yeah, kind of you know, exercises, movements does the horse have to be able to do to start? Also prerequisites, uh, prerequisites of the rider, what, you know, how, what prerequisites does the rider have to, to meet uh, to do flying changes? Then you know, we talk about um, footfalls of the canter, how to feel all three phases of the canter stride, timing of the aids. Um, we talk a lot about the strategy, psychology behind it, how you can train the horse that he thinks flying changes are a good idea, so he volunteers them, so to speak. Yeah, we have Feldenkrais exercises that help the rider uh, move better because for flying changes, you have to be pretty supple in your hips. If you're not so supple in your hips, then you're actually blocking the horse from doing flying changes, right? So it's very important that you can rotate your pelvis equally easily left and right. Um, and uh, yeah, yoga can help with that and Feldenkrais will definitely help with that. And uh, Catherine is putting together some new exercises that she hasn't uh, included in any of the other courses yet. Yeah, then we explain, of course, the seat and the aids in the flying change. We explain seat mistakes that happen that are very common in, in, in the flying changes. And then we have a couple of modules that uh, explain the troubleshooting, uh, basically every mistake that we could think of and that the first beta group could think of, we include it and we'll explain um, what the mistake consists of, how we can, how you can fix it, how you can improve it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then we have some bonus elements that you get. Um, like we have a bonus module on flying changes at the, at the long reign and the masterclass to go with it. So for those of you who are interested in long reigning. Um, one of the bonuses goes away tonight. Okay. Oh, one of them goes away tonight. Okay. <laughs> yeah, then we have a bonus module on tempo changes and the masterclass to go with it. Um, so for those who have the flying changes confirmed, this might be interesting, right? Because oh, what's next, right? Now my horse can do a single flying change in, in both directions and it's reliable, you know, then the next thing of course would be tempo changes, right? And there are certain strategies that help and that are fairly reliable, right? You get the good timing, yeah. really good timing. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> then this course, by the way, is a uh, still a beta course because the last time we offered it, we didn't get all the footage of the mistakes that we wanted. So we're hoping that this time around, we'll get the missing footage that we can put that in the course. And then um, next time we hold a finished clinic, clinic course, <laughs> getting tired. So finished course, um, you'll, you'll be in there automatically without having to pay anything, right? So you, you get to do it twice, essentially. Um, then uh, yeah, we have 10 live Q&A sessions scheduled for this. Uh, for this course that you, you can watch live or you can watch the recording. You can ask questions there, you know, if you can't make it live, you can pre-post questions that will answer for you in the 
the Q and A session. We can look at your video live. Exactly. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if, what's going on. Exactly. So if you have a video of you doing flying changes and maybe there's a problem with it, you can uh, post it in the Facebook group that's associated with our, our course. And uh, yeah, you can post it there. We'll give you feedback and we can look at it in uh, the Q&A sessions. We can share the screen, look at the video, pause the video, rewind the video so we can uh, help you figure out what's what's going on, what's not working there and what you can do differently then uh, you get access to the flying changes course q a archives you know from from the last run through the course there is an archive of 20 live sessions you know, recordings <clears throat> and uh, if you look through that you'll probably find a lot of things explained that maybe you're wondering about or questions you have may have already been answered in those. so yeah so yeah it's recordings you can yeah, listen to them in the car or while you're cleaning stalls or whatever, right? Lots of people do that. Yeah. Then we have a bonus recordings bundle with all the live streams we had done on various canter and flying changes topics. Um, so like fixing the flying change, three common mistakes in the flying changes, seat and aids in a flying change, biomechanics, flying changes versus counter canter, etc. And the top writers' mistakes, you know, in the flying changes, stuff like that. So it's a sample or a variety of um, yeah, live streams we have done. And there, there are three coaching sessions that I did with Carolyn of Riddle, who's one of our assistant instructors. And uh, so you, you can basically get to watch her writing lesson, you know, with my input it's and like with ex yeah, exactly. It's, you know, so you see the video of her writing and you hear us talking about what's going on in the video. Yeah, and then we have 14 Mo Feldenkrais movement lessons and some of them are completely new that Catherine is putting together for this, uh, for this course specifically. And that helps the writer become better, you know, balanced, straighter, more mobile because the writer has to be very straight and balanced and supple as well. If the rider's hips are stuck, you won't get a flying change because you'll be in the horse's way. You, you, know, um, you prevent the horse from changing leads if you're very stiff in your hips. Yeah, then we have the two bonus exercises for canter preparation. So yeah, the flying change requires a certain quality canter and uh, the quality of the canter depends on the quality of the transition, right? So it makes sense to, to spend some time, um, you know, finding the right exercise to prepare the canter part so that you get a, a good uh, transition into a good canter and then you just have to maintain the good canter, which is much easier than uh, taking a bad canter and turning it around and, and making it into a good canter. So if the canter part is bad, the horse starts the canter badly, poor balance and so on. It's uh, very difficult to change that and make that bad canter into a good canter. And it, you know, in a lot of cases, it's not even possible, right? So better to just uh, go back to the trot, prepare again, or to the walk, prepare again, canter again. So, you know, and we added two exercises that, that help you get a good canter depart. Yeah, so we also have more bonuses, flying changes exercise ebook. So all the exercises from the course as an ebook that you can download to your phone or you can print it, laminate it, you know, take it to the barn, that sort of thing. Um, then there's a master class on stirrup stepping because stirrup stepping always uh, shows up somehow in every course because it's so useful. Oh, nice almost every course and you know, a lot of people have never heard of it. So, so we've done master classes or live stream events in the past and now you get that um, as part of the Flying Changes course. Then we have a bonus about the uh, full pass. Um, full pass is use, useful to loosen the hips and shoulders and also to teach the horse to shift the weight. Um, so we did a whole thing on that because it's not such a a well-known exercise in, in dressage circles, right? The, the Western riders do that sort of stuff and the working equitation riders do that kind of stuff. Yeah, normal dressage riders, not so much. 
but uh, so yeah this is this will be useful in terms of preparation for the flying change then yeah we have a counter canter mini course um so counter canter can help you uh, straighten the horse improve the quality of the canter and it can be a good launching point for the flying change then we had a oh, canter yeah, live training recordings bundle so it's a variety of topics again like crookedness in the canter disunited diagonal in a balanced canter question mark uh, how to improve your candidate parts etc so it's, it's all around the canter basically yeah so here you still have the list or you can see it <laughs> i can see it but yeah, <laughs> yeah i'll post the link and oh no, I'll, I'll post the link here hold on a sec see i'm tired it's been a long day it's been a very long um, day oh, no, very long week. yeah exactly so let me huh, doesn't want to take it oh. doesn't let me post it but let me go on youtube let me see if i can post the link here i can't i know have on youtube or on youtube you did oh, you're faster than me um, I did a while ago. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> okay. So, hey, Lawrence has just signed it's up. Not looking not forward to it. Yeah, yeah. It won't let me type a comment <coughs> on Zoom. That's bizarre. Weird. Yeah, Lauren just signed up. Yeah. Mario awesome. Cicero just signed up. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Welcome, welcome, you guys. Yeah. I can't but, wait. Uh, I know. It's so much fun. Let me actually see if I can posted in the, the link in the facebook group because i can go here into the group it just takes a minute to what get there group? not group read a dressage page you know what i'm talking about oh, no, really. <laughs> and oh hold on a second here i see brenda has a question can you teach changes in long lining yes you can i have i have done that has if the horse is not too too tall, if it's not too fast, then it has the advantage that um, the horse just has to deal with his own body, his own balance, and not not with the additional weight of the rider. So um, uh, you you can do it, and we'll do a, a you know a bonus module and a, a masterclass live session on that. Yes. What exactly that? Let me see here. Now I'm just I realize here. On my phone, I don't think I see all the comments. On Facebook? On, There's only 20 comments on Facebook. Yeah. Not very many. I know, but I, I, yeah, I'm just here. Now that I've opened the page on my laptop, I okay. see questions that I didn't see on the phone. Oh. Oh. So, yeah. Yay, you can answer some more. Lisa says, Lisa Feischel says, yes, it's perfect for helping students know where else you learn step to step exercises. Oh, well, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, Lisa is a professional and she is in the was in the original course, right? The original beta course, and she's teaching flying changes to her students. And I'm glad it's useful. <laughs> glad it's helping. And uh, so here, Lara Munoz says, my horse is very sensitive. I try not to touch his mouth in excess, but just having a nice contact anyway, once he's cantering, he starts to move his head up and down. Like if the bit would be annoying for him, even if I relax the contact, he's still doing it. He's a thoroughbred three-year-old. Oh yeah, three-year-old, no wonder. Would oh, it be possible? Too young yeah, too young for flying changes. So the horse needs to be a little bit more confirmed in the balance. And when they go up and down a lot, that's often a stiffness in the hind legs that they can't flex the hind legs enough yet to really balance themselves and the rider in it. So the head goes goes up and down. Um, often they they, well, sometimes they lift the head up to, to help the hind legs lift the forehand. If the hind legs are not strong enough to lift the, the forehand, then some horses lift the head pretty high up and then they leverage themselves up into the canter. Or a lot of them do it in the canter transition, in the depart, but some of them also then maybe every stride. Um, and they often lower the neck a little bit too much in order to get the weight off of the hind legs. Because of course, if you, raise the head very high then it puts more weight on the haunches and in, in a way for the canter part they need to shift the weight back so the front legs can come off the ground but then 
could be the horse realizes, oh, now that's uncomfortable. Now my, uh, I feel stuck underneath um, the body weight with my hind leg. So they uh, throw, you know, the head down to the ground basically, and then they unload the hind legs and it sort of goes, goes up and down. So <clears throat> um, yeah, I would give the horse more time, um, help him find this balance at the walk and the trot, and then do a little bit of canter and see if you can help him find his, his balance at the canter. And then when that's more confirmed, then you can do the uh, um, yeah the flying changes later. But uh, yeah, it'll it'll probably be a I don't know three years, four years or so before he's ready to at do that. Two. At least at two, two at, at the minimum. I mean, flying changes at five is early. You know that would be. But it can happen. But yeah, it's it can, just yeah. at least two years. If if a horse is very talented, you know it happens faster and more easily. If the horse is not so talented for the flying changes, it takes a lot longer. But um, yeah, if he does flying changes by the time he's six or seven, it's still early enough, right? So it's better to, to lay a solid foundation uh, with the horse. <clears throat> Connie, let's see now for some reason, oh yeah, 22 comments it says, let me see if I can actually see them now. It, it only shows me like the top five or whatever on my laptop, I don't see the earlier ones. That's so weird. Yeah. Facebook has been so strange lately. Let me scroll a little up and down here on my phone. Actually, another thing I could try, how about if I click that to make it big, maybe I see more comments. So I just uh, don't want to miss out on any of the comments. Oh, I see yeah, there now I see a few more dogos. Oh, I said, love these bits of history. Thank you. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating too. It's really, really interesting. And uh, Delaine says, how oh, a good way to train husbands too. I don't understand it, but if that makes her happy, I'll just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah. If it works. Yeah. Hey, Natalie is there too. See, I didn't see all those on my phone. I don't know why my phone doesn't show it. So Natalie says, the hardest part I found was in doing things <coughs> to do it properly. I had to be the one that stayed absolutely relaxed in my seat and inner thigh, especially exactly. Doing those exercises kept me busy and would help me get it more relaxed in many cases, depending on the exercise. It's very true. Uh, exercises keep you moving a little bit so you can't grip and, and brace, right? And they, they help the riders get more balanced and straighter. And, and so that, that helps the relaxation. And uh, the Natalie says, even with Maggie, a not great flying change canter horse, she had finally gotten it with more ease. Good. Um, I find I'm often guilty at the canter more than other gates of a small amount of tension right under my seat and thigh right next to my seat. Once I learned to relax, that bit it flows so much easier. Yeah, yeah true. And it, it is, you know, easy or tempting to, to brace somewhere or to tighten somewhere, you know. Uh, Lara Munya says, hello from Argentina. I would like to hear more about this. It's very interesting. Yay. Donna Aloya says, we have so much material. <laughs> That's true. The courses are always pretty full with, with information, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. you're not stinky. Um, oh, Marlies says, <laughs> you look as tired as I feel. <laughs> yeah, I am tired now too. <laughs> Been along again. And I got up really early too, the last few days and get, went to bed late. <laughs> and Marty says, I don't know how you do it all these late nights, just finished work. I'm sorry, but I'm going to sleep. See you in the course. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Marty says, and several of our horses. I know. Uh... Okay. Okay. Somebody said, problem hearing. No. Will I be able to watch again later? Yes. Yes. We'll record no, yeah. it. Um, yeah, you can see, and you can also watch on YouTube. It would be interesting to see if that's just a, a Facebook issue that the, the sound is low or quiet, or yeah, go, go if find it's on Facebook. On artistic is the, just search for artistic yeah, massage. Zoom, okay. Yeah, tell them to go on artistic on YouTube. On YouTube. Oh, Natalie was saying too, she found, found it very, sound very quiet. But yeah, if you mm. go, yeah, yeah join on Zoom or join or look on, on YouTube, then uh, you, the sound might be better, hopefully. Let me 
scroll down on my phone because I was it showed me some of the comments earlier, but not all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let me check on Zoom. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Christina says Zoom sound okay. Kathleen says I actually have to turn down the sound on Zoom. Ah. Terry Rath sound on Zoom is fine. So it's a Facebook glitch. I mean, Facebook is really falling apart at the oh, scene. Facebook is awful. They're more and more glitchy and uh, not, you know, really dependable. <laughs> so time for an alternative. No kidding. I've not been happy with Facebook. Yeah. Why we're doing YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're switching to YouTube. Oh, Barbara said I did too. Have to turn down the sound on Zoom. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So it's it's a Facebook problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the course will be open for enrollment for two more days, and then it closes, and then you'll have to wait another year or so. Yeah. Till next year. Till next year. Until we open it again. Um. So if you're interested, you can you can click on, on the link with the with the sign up page. You get more information, what's in there, and so on. Um, you have yeah you know, lifetime access to our courses, all of the courses. So if somebody's worried about not being able to keep up, you know, with with the materials, don't worry about it. Just go as slowly as you like. And unlike some other course people mm -hmm. um, we don't take it away we don't take away access mm -hmm. exactly you have, you have it forever basically right we don't take as access, long as we're alive, you'll have access yeah and uh so if somebody gets sick or the horse gets injured you can interrupt the course and then come back to it when you're when you're healthy again when the horse is healthy again and you know, pick up where you left off or start over um when we run the course again you're you'll be in it anyway this time right because this is a beta course but even in the future when we run the course again you can still be in the group post videos ask questions unlimited support yeah so the support just keeps going right and uh, and you can ask questions that aren't related to fine yeah exactly yeah and you can do yeah participate in all the q and a's of the later or future courses um ask questions in them you can submit videos you know to uh, you know even when this course is, is over and you know but, but onto future courses you can still send your videos and, and we'll analyze them and, and uh, um, give you tips on them so uh, um, so no stress no no time constraints fine yeah, not every course can do everything in the yeah, exactly yeah. That's okay. exactly yeah Oh, oh, here on Zoom, there were a couple more questions. Let me go back up. So Christina had said, I know that you just a few days ago offered a straightness course. I was not able to join. That was a few months ago by now. She said, yeah. I would like to join the next one. Do you have any idea when you will release it again? Straightness. Uh, yeah, next year. Next year, we'll do straightness again. Um, uh, Most likely 2021. Uh, yeah. Next course is we have picking up on what went down and contact. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> she says, in a lesson, my trainer straightens even the last hair on my head, but alone I cannot <laughs> somehow make it. I could not afford the course right now, but in the future, definitely want to join. Yeah, yeah. It'll come around again next year. Yeah. Yeah. Kimberly said, I already signed up for the Flying Changes course. Ooh. The teaching in this course is is worth 10 times what we pay on. Oh, thank you. That's yeah, so sweet of you. Totally. Yeah, we try to answer all the questions and try to, you know, give useful advice. You know, to Where was that from? Zoom, Kimberly. And and there says, thanks very much, Thomas, for your time. I have to leave early because it's my hubby's birthday. We're going out for dinner, but really looking forward to several things in the new Cantor course. Yay. Yeah, Anne was in there last time around. And Aoife says, do you just put your body into next gate? If that's the case, what happens if the horse doesn't change gates? That's, it's not quite that. It's, it's a little bit more involved. I mean, basically, it follows that shift the weight, change the bend, move the croup of the horse. 
So it's a little more eventually, you know, the horse will get to that point where you just change the body movement. But when, when the horse has never done it, you have to be more explicit and you have to ex explain it more and, and lead the horse more. And each step may take several strides, like the shifting the weight may take more than one stride, changing the bend, you know, so that it's established when may change more than one, one stride and, and, and so on and so on. Eventually it all becomes more efficient and gets faster and so on. But um, um, initially the horse needs time to think it through and, you know, work through all these these steps right in the in the rider in a way too if the rider doesn't have much um experience you know with it they need time to to go go through it too you know and then think through it well, here above the if i said do you have suggestions on how to keep rhythm through transitions for me the transitions became an end destination a moment of celebration so then i would lose the mm. continuity yeah a transition from one one gate to the next yeah you have to think beyond the transition right i mean i used to do that too that i thought you know basically my job is done when i'm in the new gate and then i realized that's when the job starts right so you have to keep riding and you know of course the the rhythm changes from one gate to the next right and then you yeah, you create a smooth transition by, by making the horse nice balanced and straight before the transition then keep the straightness and the balance in the transition and then you have to immediately tell the horse which tempo you want, which stride length you want, how much energy you want, and keep the horse aligned on the line of travel. And uh, yeah, then, then the transitions become smoother. So. <clears throat> Christina then had said, sometimes, I sometimes ask for canter with the outside leg, but usually outside plus immediately inside leg, but in the left lead canter also uh, try to ask with the inside leg, bent left and left leg it used to go inside. But the last one didn't function about the problem with a half pass. I think she can see the difference because of using the weight eight and a half pass. I go into the movement in canter transition. I put weight on the outside seat bone, but I think in the beginning she used to be a little confused. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if, if you use a little touch of the outside leg behind the girth and then the inside leg to, to trigger the change, uh, to trigger the candidate part that can that can work and then it's it's distinct from the half pass aid and then tanya vanilla says really appreciate you providing sessions like this very helpful and motivating i'm glad i'm glad it, it motivates you to get out and ride and try it <laughs> yeah so good okay let me now have to jump back over here to see if anything new happened on Facebook. I know. I know. So Liv Ann Edwardson says, my horse is 22 pre, starting to be balanced after doing uh, EOTM exercises. Do you think he's too old to join the flying change course? Oh, if he's healthy, you know, there's no reason why he shouldn't be able to learn flying changes. It's like horses are like people, right? The brain can learn basically as long as we live, right? And um, if he's healthy, if he's sound, yeah, why not? You know, um, of yeah. course, if the horse is not not really sound, then I probably wouldn't push it. But you know, if he's happy and working, yeah, sleeping now. exactly, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you know, the exercises for the flying changes—they always make the horses more balanced, straighter, more supple in their body. So even if a horse doesn't actually do a flying change at the end, you know, after you've ridden the exercise for a while, he will be better, you know, more supple, healthier, moving in a, in a healthier way. Um, that's, you know, in clinics sometimes, you know, people wanted to do flying changes and very often then we could get a flying change within the lesson. Um, then sometimes it doesn't work out, right? Because maybe one session is not enough to teach a flying change, right? Depending on where they start. But you could always see the improvement in the horse's posture and the horse's suppleness, balance, rideability, and, and so on. So uh, so if your 22-year-old, you know, ends up not getting the flying change, he should be better and softer, rounder, smoother, and so on. 
and healthier, you know, as a result of these exercises. But yeah, there's no no reason why he shouldn't be able to learn um, a flying change, especially if the canter is decent. You know, then you know he should be able to do it. Okay, let's see here. Where were we? Check on YouTube, but there's so few people, no questions. And um, Zoom, no more new questions. Um, yeah, do you have any more questions? Otherwise, we could also come to an end slowly but surely. Yes, very lovely. So let me just check all the different spots where we are. So, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look like anybody has any more questions. I guess in that case, I know. thank you for being here and watching. Thanks for your questions. And uh, yeah, we'll be doing more live streams over, over time. Don't know when. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah, exactly. We're so, adding stuff that will only be on YouTube. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're building our YouTube channel now. Yep. So. Uh, New videos coming this next week. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, go check it out and subscribe. And, well, otherwise, have a good weekend and uh, well, we'll see you soon. Bye.